July is National Savings Month and it's never been more important to raise awareness because South Africa has one of the worst saving rates in the world, way below our emerging market peers. According to a report by Deloitte, our national savings rate, the GDP that is saved rather than spent in an economy, is a dismal 0.5%. Investment by South Africans is also on the decrease, accounting for 14.8% of our nominal GDP in December last year, down from 17% in the previous quarter. With rising food and fuel prices, soaring interest rates and the high cost of living, some may say this is not surprising. But with 90% of South Africans not saving enough for retirement, an economic crisis is brewing. This is No Ordinary Wednesday. It's our in-depth look at what's driving markets, shaping the economy and changing the game. A warm welcome. I'm Jeremy Max. Today, we've got two in-house Investec experts with us to help provide some clarity around the differences between saving and investing and how to choose the right financial vehicle for your goals. This is an important conversation. René Grobler, Head of Investec Cash Investments, and Irbeth van Heerden, Head of Investment Distribution at Investec Wealth and Investment, A very warm welcome to both of you to No Ordinary Wednesday. René, to you first then. I've outlined in the introduction the dire state of South Africa's savings health, and it really doesn't make a pretty picture. So why are we not saving as a nation, I wonder? And what should we be saving every month? Jeremy, I think that's the million-dollar question. Why are South Africans not saving? And I think one of the considerations here would really just be income levels. So some of the main reasons here would be the high cost of living that South Africans face. You probably mentioned inflation and lived inflation in South Africa, I think, is way above the 6% that we read about in the CPI numbers. The next one really is just unemployment, the high levels of unemployment in South Africa. If you don't have income, it's very hard to save anything. Zero of zero is still zero. So, you know, really just the low income levels, the unemployment, and then very high debt levels in South Africa as well. And this we can see across sort of various demographics in South Africa. That leads me also to just one of the thoughts around social pressures. South Africans like to keep up with the Joneses. So they really care about the car they drive, the house they live in. And I think many of us in South Africa are living beyond our means. So that doesn't really leave much for saving at the end of the day. The other option here in terms of explaining the low savings levels, and I think it is a factor, is just inertia of not really understanding the options available to you. You know, it becomes very daunting when you start searching. I don't know if you've tried searching for savings or investment products online. It gets very complex very quickly. And we know we've got low financial literacy levels in South Africa. So that really also plays a part. So I hope that covers some of the reasons on the first part of your question and why South Africans are not saving. The next question is really how much should we be saving? And uh, there, I think it's a difficult question. I would like to answer it with an Einstein quote, which is really that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And you might wonder where I'm going with this, but really those who understand it earn it and those who don't pay it, as Einstein said. And really it is about saving early. So even if you don't have a lot to save, Starting early and uh, the wonder of time passing with your investment is really one of the most amazing things that you can do. So I haven't really answered how much you should save. Rule of thumb says 20% of your income. But again, you probably need financial advice here because it depends on your savings goals. It depends on your life stage. It depends on so many factors around, you know, do you have children you're looking after? Are you saving for retirement? Is there a house that you need to buy? What are your financial obligations? So this is where I really would recommend that you seek some professional help. Many South Africans think that they don't qualify for a financial advisor at their income level, but that's not true. You can probably find some level of financial advice doesn't matter what your income level is. So it really helps to have a plan. And then in terms of sticking to that plan, that's usually the difficult part. And the piece that I could recommend here is don't wait to save after you've spent everything you need to spend. Rather save first and put your savings away. And a little hack that you can use there is a debit order or a scheduled payment every month to make sure that whether you've decided it's 20% or 10% or whatever it might be, that it actually goes into a savings product before you start spending. So these are some of the sort of tips and tricks and some of the conventional wisdom around how much you should be saving. René, we're going to get to product in just a moment, but just test my maths on the second question. Interest rates in South Africa right now at their highest level in 14 years. We know the Reserve Bank is trying to combat inflation. So this is hurting people with debt 
but it should be encouraging savings. But I suspect you're going to tell me this isn't the case. Well, it's a it's a bit of a tale of two stories, I would say. Those who have money and excess cash, and we've seen quite a bit of that in our savings accounts at the moment. Our savings balances are exceptionally high, and you would expect that where cash rates are high, they are taking advantage, but it really is the few. And I think for most South Africans, the debt and the interest rate hikes on debt has really, really hurt disposable income. As you said, this is the highest interest rate or the steepest interest rate hike we've seen since 2006. I think we went up 4.75% since we started hiking in November 2021. And this comes off the back of COVID. People already hurting a lot of job losses. People trying to recover from the damage small businesses, etc. face in the COVID period. And suddenly we faced with a rising level of debt. So, yes, unfortunately, I think South Africans are suffering. But there is something to consider here as well in terms of your savings. What I've noticed, and it's a, it's a strange phenomenon, people will have credit card debt and car debt and household debt, yet they will still have money in a savings product. If you start thinking about what the interest rate is that you're paying on your credit card debt versus the interest that you're earning on your savings product, it would make a lot of sense to think about paying off your most expensive debt first. But unfortunately, that is the position that a lot of South Africans find themselves in, that they have a mountain of debt and they feel intimidated to even start thinking about savings. And that segues very nicely into my next question, Rene. And Ebeth, I'm going to get to you in just a moment. But uh, just very quickly then, Rene, what savings opportunities then in this current harsh environment should people be exploring? So there are many opportunities and Ebeth's going to talk quite a bit about, you know, the investment opportunities, I think I'm going to focus on the shorter term options available. Because from a savings point of view, we typically look at an investment horizon or between zero, 12 months, maybe even up to three years could be the window of opportunity. And really, what you think about there is what is my risk appetite? If I firstly want to make sure that I don't lose any money, I want my capital protected, then I, I look at low risk options like potentially cash, bank deposits. And typically we see also our retiree community very much interested in cash deposits because they often living off the interest. But risk is a consideration. And then obviously liquidity. So how soon do you need access to your money? Are you able to fix it for a period of time or do you need it available for slush funds? So as an example, emergency cash, you would put in instant access and money that you may be saving for a house deposit next year, you could maybe put in a fixed deposit or a notice account. So that brings me to the products. Once you've kind of answered those two questions and you land on a space where you say, I want a low risk option with you know, liquidity sort of in the near term, then you can look at bank deposit savings products. And at the moment, with our interest rates where they are, you can earn anywhere between 8 and 9% in the shorter term. We are potentially nearing the top or we are already at the top, depending on which way you think the MPC is going to go of an interest rate cycle. So, you know, this is really an opportunity to to get access to those kind of rates. And with inflation, theoretically, between 3 and 6%, you are still beating inflation in cash, which I think is quite an important consideration when you're saving or investing. So, Ebeth, let's bring in investment solutions into this conversation. And this might sound like a really silly question, but my father always used to say there's no such a thing as a silly question. What are the key differences between savings and an investment? And your father would be a very wise man, Jeremy. So savings and investments essentially are both allocating money towards your future self. And so I can completely see how that is confusing for investors and for our clients. But it's important to understand that there is a difference between the terminology and ultimately what it will do for you and your money. Savings is typically putting money aside little bits by little bits. And it is seen as a more conservative and certain way of saving for a very specific goal. And usually it's a short term goal. When I mentioned it earlier, some clients save for a holiday at the end of the year, somebody's wedding in 18 months from now, or towards a deposit for a home, maybe. But typically, it's important to understand that savings main objective is looking for fixed returns and capital stability, and for that money to be certain at a short notice period. Investing, on the other hand, takes into account a much longer term view. It's what am I saving for for my longer term self? And that longer term self would typically include something like your retirement. And that's important to know 
because for those kind of longer term periods, we would look to allocate capital in stock markets, for instance, growth assets, as we call them in the industry. And growth assets are really something that you would want to consider within your overall financial plan in the right way because they put your capital at risk. And capital at risk here means that the stock market is volatile. It moves up, it moves down. And if you need the capital on a short-term notice basis, the price of the market might be down on that day and your capital might then be less than what you were hoping for it to be. The real difference is ultimately determined by what is your financial goal? Why are you saving this money and what are you putting it away for? And it's very important to be clear on that from the start because it will make a significant difference over time in terms of the returns that you see in your portfolio. So I'm asking myself the question now, what should or what does a good investment portfolio look like? Is there a standard formula? Such a great question. There is a standard formula in this sense. I would tell investors a good investment has three essential criteria. Essentially, a good investment portfolio is well diversified It's managed by a qualified, experienced and professional investment management team. And very importantly, it is managed according to every investor's specific individual investment goal. That is a good investment portfolio. Why isn't it standard? And can I use an example here? Might sound boastful, but I mean this sincerely and very humbly. The Investec Equity Fund at the end of June has been the top performing domestic equity fund in South Africa. Now, we are acutely aware that that number is a 12-month number only. We are most proud of the fact, though, that every investor that has invested in this fund for multiple years, over all meaningful periods, have seen the fund exceed the fund's benchmark. And we're very proud of Paul Dukar and the investment team for that achievement. Does that make it a good investment? Yes and no. Yes, because of what I mentioned earlier, it's managed by a great professional team. It is risk appropriate for clients with a longer term investment view, if that's their investment goal. The answer is no for clients that have a short term investment horizon. We always come back to say there isn't a standard approach. And part of what's always tricky for me and Renee with conversations like this is we cannot give investors financial advice. So let me ask you this question then if we can about unit trusts. Remind me what they are quickly and then Is there a point at which one should include them in your investment portfolio? Unit trust, the technical term for a unit trust, it's a form of a collective investment and it's constituted, which means it's protected under a trust deed. In practice, what it means, a unit trust pulls investors' money into a single fund, which is then managed by a professional fund manager. This is of huge benefit to investors in the sense that my money together with a bunch of other investors' money gets given to an investment manager that manages the money in a professional way in a very specific mandate or investment objective. And Jeremy, I always think that Unitrust probably democratized the stock market. It created an easy and affordable way for ordinary investors to access financial markets. Is there a point in which it should be included? Given the accessibility, you can start saving in most unit trust funds or investing in most unit trust funds, depending on the mandate of the fund, for some funds from as little as 500 rand a month. I would think that if you were thinking of investing and it fits your financial plan, there's no point where it's not potentially a suitable investment for clients. Rene, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment because I want to talk about cash and where you put cash in an investment portfolio. But both of you have made so much sense to me. Ebeth, very quickly, why isn't everyone then investing for their future? Why isn't everyone doing this? Because most people, and Rene mentioned it at the beginning as well, most people, Jeremy, thinks that investing is not for them. Most ordinary South Africans think that to participate in investing and investing for the long term, you need a large amount of money to start investing. And you can see how this is a problem, also to the point that Rena made earlier on, because we all then miss out on Einstein's miracle of compound growth. That's the one thing. The other thing is, is that there is a very low level of financial education in South Africa and understanding the industry. And there's so much more that we can do to make investing and savings more accessible. Things like this podcast, for instance. 
And then I think the other thing is, is that because there's so much news and noise around investment markets, typically investors think that it's going to be exceptionally time consuming, firstly, to understand all of this. And secondly, that investing is for professionals only. But what we miss out on is that you don't have to do this alone. You get financial advice. You can educate yourself in terms of the basics that you would want to do. I mean, there's quick wins for investors that we can talk about if you'd like. But there are many ways in which you can access the investment market without being an investment professional yourself. We just spoke about unit trusts. They're such accessible vehicles to access the market. And then the other thing I want to say is that I do think that there's a perception that given the volatility of the stock market, that it's too risky for most investors or that potentially there's clearly defined right and wrong time to enter the market. Now, that's probably the oldest adage in the investment industry is that you can't time the market. It's time in the market that counts, right? And once again, investors don't have to do this alone. They can get professional advice that could be an outsourced way for them to have an investment portfolio managed by investment professionals. Timing the market, thinking you're going to know when to buy and when to sell, on the contrary, is probably one of the biggest investment mistakes that investors can make. We are going to continue this conversation in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to remind you that if you're enjoying the program, please take a moment to rate our channel, Investec Focus Radio SA, on your podcast platform of choice. So, Rene, let's get back to you. I did mention cash. Let's return to savings if we can, which is ultimately a cash investment. Is it a good long-term investment proposition? And where does one place cash then in an investment portfolio? feel a bit like a politician. Uh, I'm tempted to not answer your question and just say what what I want to say. And I'm, I'm tempted to kind of uh, talk around the issue and not give you an answer. So excuse me if I do. But um, I think, again, it depends. And this is where the politician piece comes in. It depends on your life stage. And generally, so let me give you a general answer. Generally, saving in cash for a long term period is not a good idea. And that's because of inflation. Over the long term, cash does not typically historically beats inflation. And so that really means that your hard-earned money can go backwards. Having said that, if you are in a life stage, and we mentioned retirement as an example, and you really have saved over your lifetime and you've got sufficient cash, and your biggest objective, and that's where I agree with Ebeth, is you really need to think about what is your objective. Uh, If your objective is just to not lose your money and basically make sure that your capital is preserved and earn something on top of it, then it could be for an extended period of time, not a bad idea to have high percentage of cash in your portfolio because you have stability, you have certainty around the outcome and the interest rates. Because with investment, you do take an element of risk around your capital, but also around your returns. So typically for younger people, I would say, don't put your money under the mattress. Don't put it all in cash. And to the second part of your question, where does cash make sense in a portfolio? Typically, cash is used as a liquidity buffer. So that means when you need instant access to money, and Ebeth, you were talking about the equity fund as an example, you don't want to put money into an equity fund that you might need tomorrow because you might have to cash out when that unit trust is you know, in a dip. And it's going to go up and down over a period of time. So what a lot of smart investors would do is they would have their longer term money in equity portfolios, diversified, offshore potentially, and then they would have a component of that money sitting in cash. And that would be, you know, money they might need for, and you mentioned some of it, but school fees. It's also good to have some emergency buffer. You just never know what happens in your life and you might need some of that cash. And then certain shorter term savings goals would go in there. The funds that Ebeth spoke about uh, from a unit trust point of view, a lot of them also have, and depending on their risk mandate, they also have a component of cash in there, but it's not accessible to the unit holder as an example on its own. So that's why it's always good to have a portion of cash on hand. I think I recall seeing the Savings Institute of South Africa saying that another interest rate hike, Rene, is going to plunge us into an economic recession. If that happens, what would that do to our ability to save? The latest sort of predictions, I think, is that we might at most see another 25 basis points hike. And I think a lot of the analysts are on the fence as to whether that's going to happen or not, particularly because of what you just mentioned, uh, you know. How much more can South Africans absorb? We haven't spoken about the obvious things that, you know, are affecting people, load shedding, 
all the challenges that we face in South Africa, which just increases your cost of living almost exponentially, to add another debt burden or increase the debt burden for South Africa, yes, it might curb inflation, but which is the lesser of two evils, recession or curbing inflation? Sadly, it is something we need to plan for, but it is also something that when taking on debt, it's something to consider because we just saw how quickly interest rates hiked. You know, if you're buying a house, you're buying a car, you might think it's within your affordability at a point in time, but you really need to consider what happens if interest rates go up. So this is probably a time for people to really just think about their spending habits, think about right-sizing potentially expenses, how they're living, and become quite frugal around it because I don't think we're in for an easy time over the next few months. Renee, thank you very much indeed for that very sage advice. Uh, Ebeth, I've got uh, two quick questions before we come to the end of our conversation. First one is on investments themselves then. What are the key considerations and risks that new investors should be aware of when starting the so-called wealth creation journey, given the kind of economic discussion and concerns that Rene has just raised? Jeremy, we've probably seen that the most successful investors are investors that are able to stick to their strategy. And wealth creation lives in an ecosystem of competence and even excellence. And there's two parts to that. One part obviously is generating great investment returns for clients. And the other part to that is having a partnership with our end investors in this sense that we truly understand their investment goals and that they understand how they allocate their savings and their investments towards those goals, right? And actually what I'm saying is that for every investor, an investment journey should start with a financial plan. And specifically, if we are thinking of a cash-strapped consumer, is to be very clear on what that financial plan looks like, what your goals are, right, is at the base of that. According to your investment goals and savings goals, you will design a financial plan together with a professional and then only do you start choosing investment products. Having said that, I think every investor needs to think of just three things. You need to have a cash buffer. You need to have an emergency fund, right? And that's tricky to do in an environment where we see low economic growth and a tough savings environment like you and Rena has discussed earlier as well, but that's essential. If that's three to six months, maybe make it three months, whatever you can afford, but that has to be built in. Then secondly, over the long term, you will be really grateful for starting as soon as possible to take full advantage of the benefit of tax efficient investing, like participating in a retirement fund or contributing to a tax-free investment vehicle. Then the last thing I want to add to that is consistency. It's whatever is within your plan, stick with it. Now, investments are often seen to be racy because markets are volatile and there's so many external factors influencing it. But the most successful investors are actually just participating in a spectacularly mundane investment process. They clear on their goals, they have a well-defined plan, and they have the right products that support them on that journey. And then I often think the biggest risk for investors are themselves and their own behavior. You know, we get fearful when we see asset prices go down and then we want to sell all of it. And when asset prices go up, we get all optimistic and giddy and just downright greedy and want to buy very, very expensive assets or allocate capital to very expensive assets. Now, that kind of investor behavior actually has a name in the industry. It's called investor behavior tax because it creates a self-perpetuating cycle of wealth destruction. Buying high and selling low is not a good investment strategy. And then just in conclusion, we've seen the RAND depreciate to Ebeth against the US dollar by around 13.5% since December last year. So the RAND is weak at the moment. Is this a good time to invest offshore? Jeremy, probably the number one question we get. I want to say two things first is that the RAND is notoriously difficult to predict in terms of which way it's going to go, strengthen or weaken. It is known to be one of the most volatile currencies in the world. And then I think I want to anchor everyone that listens to this on this point is that the RAND exchange rate is merely one factor to take into account when deciding how much and when you should invest offshore. Having said that, it is the view of our global investment strategy group. So the global investment strategy group is our group of professionals with multi-decade experience that informs our global macro views 
that ultimately points us and guides us in how we allocate our clients' capital in our own unit trust funds and in our investment management business. That's a long way of saying the Global Investment Strategy Group's view is that actually the RAND will strengthen over the next 12 months. Now that strengthening, I think, needs to be seen in the context of really what our expectation is as a weaker dollar. Now, it's very difficult to know when that would change, but the way we see it is that global economic growth could slow down. Our expectation is for it to slow down, which in return will have an effect on the U.S. market. And now the recent earnings season have been quite resilient in the U.S. And that's why it's so difficult to put a timeline to that. When it will change direction, I can't precisely tell you, but it is our expectation that the rand will strengthen over the shorter term, given like the next 12 months. I'd say is a fair assumption. I also want to add this to it is that it is the RAND and the RAND is part of an emerging markets currency basket. And there's always an exciting element of political risk that goes with that. And once again, I just want to say is that the RAND is one point. Ultimately, the reason we invest offshore as South Africans is for diversification, to get access to stock markets globally in regions and sectors that doesn't exist in our local market. That is a consistent motivating factor that doesn't change. And the last thing I want to say on this is that, as always, investors don't have to make these decisions by themselves. They can seek professional financial advice from an investment manager or from a wealth manager and design a financial plan accordingly that will determine the right allocation for them. That is uh, Ebbe van Heerden along with René Grobler. To both of you, thank you so much for uh, all the information and for joining us on this edition of No Ordinary Wednesday. Please join us again in a fortnight as we continue to explore money trends shaping your world. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, search for Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts and please hit that subscribe button. Until next time, goodbye from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long-term insurer. For important information that should be considered prior to investing, please refer to the minimum disclosure document that you will find on Investec.com.